No, we're good. We're good. All right, we're going to get started here in just a second. I've got to uh, get my glasses on here. All right, so we are going to be talking about, uh, we're continuing with what we've been talking about, and uh, which is all of these different kings that are in uh, First and Second Kings. But I thought um, we would, uh, we talked about Asa last week, we're going to talk about Jehoshaphat, I just like saying that name, uh, Jehovah Jehoshaphat. Um, and so uh, we, we need to kind of talk about standing up for Jesus and the reason that we saw, and, and the people at home of course don't know this, but I showed a video from the Hubble Space Telescope, 100 Best Images, and one of the ideas is, is for us to get to the point where we live by faith, not by sight. And the reason, you know, we've been talking about this for, for quite a while at this point, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you know, we're, we're called to walk by faith, not by sight, is that there's a whole bunch of people in this world who think the earth is flat. There are a bunch of people in this world who don't believe anything up above us is that there's no space or any of those, that that's all just, you know, the moon landing was faked or whatever it might be. And so we would, we're like, oh yeah, there's, there's these planets or whatever that are up there. But when you see those images, it blows you away, right? To see the grandeur of it and that it's not just our solar system, that there's universes and galaxies and all that. You know what I mean? There's just this whole massive bunch of stuff that's out there. And because we can't see it, what's our problem? Can't see it with my naked eye. I don't believe in it because I can't see it. And there's a lot of people who are in that boat. And for us, a lot of people live that way in terms of the Bible. Can't see it. Don't believe it. Can't see it with my own eyes. And so, again, if we're called to live by faith, things, things change. So we have to get to the point to where we are sitting here trying to understand uh, what is possible and what is not possible. All right, so let's, let's look here for just a second because I think it, it becomes important for us to care more about what God thinks uh, than what the world thinks. So if we look, and we're in uh, 1 Kings 22, and um, it's Jehoshaphat, and remember we talk about kingdom in the north is Israel, kingdom in the south is Judah, the king in the north is Ahab. You know, Ahab and Jezebel, you hear those names. The king in the south is Jehoshaphat. Asa's son is who's taken over at this point. And that's, that's where we're picking up. And they're trying to decide whether to go to war or not. They're trying to make a decision about this. And they're trying to make an alliance to fight a king that's against the Israelites. Okay, so it says in verse 1, so in 1 Kings 22, 1, For three years there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel uh, had said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First, seek the counsel of the Lord. Now, we're far enough along in 1 Kings to know that Ahab and Jezebel are not godly people. And in fact, uh, Ahab at one time might have been. <coughs> Jezebel is the king of Tyre and Sidon. That's his daughter. She was raised with idols, worshiping false idols, all kinds of gods, um, doing really detestable things. And so when Ahab married her, it actually just drug them both downhill. And they do everything, you know, like we talked about last week in terms of uh, what was going on with Abijah, what was going on in Asa's family with, you know, Asherah poles and sacred stones and sacrificing your kids in the fire and all those kind of things. And so Jehoshaphat, who is a godly man, was raised by Asa, his dad, who was a godly man. Remember, we talked about last week, we struggled at the end of his life. He was struggling. But, you know, the, the scripture still says Asa served God his whole life, our life. And so Jehoshaphat takes over. Ahab says, are we going to go to war together? And Jehoshaphat says, can we ask the Lord? And actually, Ahab's answer is right here. We're at that point. It says, um, but Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I, should I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into your hands. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? 
Uh, no, there's not, because Je Jezebel and Ahab have killed them all. They have done everything they can. Remember, we're, we're at the point where Elijah was the only prophet, remember? And they go to, to Mount Carmel, and there's, there's the showdown between the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And he, you remember, he calls, he prays to God. They're praying to their gods. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all that stuff. And uh, Elijah prays, and fire comes down from heaven and burns up his sacrifice. And then he has all of those prophets killed. Elijah does. It's supposed to be a turning to the Lord, and it's not. It, it is... Just, Jezebel and Ahab are basically going, no, we're not turning back to the Lord. So at this point, he, he asked the questions are no longer a prophet. And so remember, there's 400 other prophets, and Micah is supposedly God's one true prophet. And then watch what happens here because it's just, it's, this is one of the few places where the Bible has sarcasm, I believe. It says, the king should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. I'm in verse 9. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, bring uh, Micah, son of Imla, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on the thrones of the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of uh, Kenanah, had made iron horns, and he declared, this is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they're destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same exact thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger had gone to summon Micah, said to him, Look, the other prophets without exception are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micah said, As surely as the Lord lives, I can only tell him, uh, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. That's the sarcasm I was talking about, I do believe. The king said to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like a sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me but only bad? Micah continued, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I'm the Lord sitting on his throne with all of the, I'm sorry, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all of his multitudes of heaven, standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this, another that. Finally, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Kenanah, went up and slapped Micah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Micah replied, you'll find out on the day you go to hide in your inner room. And it keeps on. It says, The king uh, of Israel then ordered, Take Micah and send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, This is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micah declared, If you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. And he added, my, Mark my word, all you people. All right. So for us in our walk with Christ, I believe this is becoming more real for us every single day. The longer that we live, you know, when uh, in the late 1970s through the 80s, it was easy to be a Christian in the United States. Almost everybody was Christian. Churches were full. There were churches being planted everywhere. There's a church on every street corner. Still are. They're just in, right now? Yeah. And so, for the most part, when, when you're, you know, if you're, it's kind of funny because, um, you know, if you go to uh, a UT ball game and you're not for UT, oh my goodness, there's 108,000 UT fans there. And my son, who is a huge, my youngest son is a huge Georgia fan. And wherever he goes, he's going to have on a big jersey, Bob, that says Georgia Bulldogs and a number on it right there. And he goes and he stands there and he goes, yes, go Bulldogs, Bulldogs, Bulldogs. And 107,000 people are going, somebody needs to do something about that. Somebody needs to get him out of here, right? That is that kind of thing. 
that's the kind of environment that we're in as Christians today, I believe. I believe that there's so many people who are walking up and slapping us in the face saying, what are you going to do about that, right? I mean, it's, it's the same as what's going on here. And yet Micah was willing to stand up because he could have gone, 401 is uh, four, right? 400 were saying go, and he could have gone, uh, it's not what the Lord said, but I don't want to get in a big, uh, mess, you know, big fight about it. So, yes, I'll, I'll say, go. 401 people saying yes. Instead, the kings are looking at him, all these people and all the crowd are sitting there, and he goes, God said don't go. God says you're going to be killed if you go. He's done it on purpose so that you will be killed because you're so evil and you have turned so far from him. And at that point, the king goes, throw him in jail, give him bread and water, don't. And then Micah's like, not really going to matter because you're not going to be around much longer anyway. <laughs> That's what he says. Um, he says those words. And for us, how do we get to the point of that whether we are in a public school environment or you know going to school, we're in a college environment. And I will state that probably to me, the college environment is probably one of the most difficult right now for anybody that's in that 18 to 30 age group that's going to college because it is just a, you know, it's a place where um, they want to challenge you to use your mind, but only if you think like them. That is, the, that is where we are at this point with colleges and universities. Not all of them. I'm not lumping everybody in. But that is for your, you know, they, they look at you and they go, oh, you're one of those superstitious Christians who believes in faith and all that stuff. And that's, none of that's real. So we'll discount all of that prophecy. Oh, we're discounting all that. And we're just going to deal with facts, right? Okay. Um, so for us, we sit here and we go, okay, where am I going to go in my family, at work, uh, in my neighborhood, in my state? And be able to stand up for what God says is right. You know, the idea is, um, you know, uh, the actual drag queen stuff that they're doing at Public Life Children's Book. And he said, I want to come to your libraries and read this book to, to kids. And so the library system is, in certain states said, no, we don't want you there. And so he basically got lined up some lawyers. And the lawyer said, you don't want him there? Can I get that in writing that you don't want him there? Um, and then, of course, discrimination and all of that came in. And they're like, well, you know, you let, if you're going to let these people read, you should let these people read. And, and that's just where it went to. And so he went to, the first one was held in Indianapolis, and he went there to a public library in Indianapolis, and 2,500 people showed up to listen to him tell, you read his Christian, you know, kids book. So, um, but I didn't do that. I didn't stand up in the midst of that. Um, he did. And so here we are, and there's going to be times where people you know, get in your face, and they may just be questioning to start with. Remember we always talk about that sometimes when people disagree with you, they just go, really, that's what you believe? Prove it to me, kind of thing. Then sometimes they mock you and laugh at you, right? We've seen that. There's, there's that aspect, you know, the, and that's what the media tends to do to you is to put you in place. And then the next step, if you don't stop, is to what? Threaten you. Right? We're going to make some threats. We're going to disparage your name and who you are. And then the next step is violence. And then the next step would be murder. And I'm going to do away with you and then you know, make you disappear completely because we disagree with each other. And we've seen all of those. I mean, we've, we've seen in our in our country, for sure. But how do we get to the point where we're willing to stand up even on an island? And what I mean by that is all by ourselves. How are we going to get to the point where we can stand up and say, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I do believe the Bible is true. I do believe in, in faith. I do believe in prophecy. I do believe in, right, all those things. And instead, we're silent. And when, our, when we're silent, what happens? When good people do nothing, evil prospers. When good people do nothing, evil prospers. And, and I get it because, you know, we're, we're all about, well, Jesus was a loving person and he loved everybody and he, and he, you know, all this kind of stuff. But actually, if you go, go look at your Bible and see how many times Jesus looked at certain groups of people and went, you brood of vipers. I can't believe you're saying that, right? The wood's going to get cut down, going to be burned up in a fire. And, you know, the, the wood that's not producing fruit. So here we are, and we're trying to figure out, okay, so how on earth, what can I do when I feel like I'm all by myself? And so, you know, there's a couple of ways that I can go with this. Let, let's talk about, are we ever truly alone as a Christian? Now, I'm talking about as a Christian. This is, you know, non-Christian would be this way. I'm just talking about Christians. Are we ever truly alone? Okay, so let's look at it together. We're going, we're going to dig into God's Word. They're there on the table. So you got them on your phones. You look, up, look with me, please. Um, 
Let's look at, uh, uh, let's, let's start off with Hebrews 13, 5. All right, so Hebrews, it, you know, if you find it real quick, yell out the page number for some of the people that are using the same Bible as you. That'll help them get there quicker. Hebrews, written by Paul, 13, 5, back of your Bible. I'm losing this sword real badly. 13, 5. 13, 5. 1598. Okay. I heard five. Wasn't that when Magellan sailed in 1598? 13, 5. Hebrews 13, 5. Y'all are confusing one another. Me too. <laughs> All right. This is a series of, you know, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. It's kind of like little, you know, suggestions, advice, that kind of stuff that's being written here. It's concluding exhortations is what it's called. And it starts off in, in verse 5 and it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Okay? As a Christian, I want you to hear that. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. All right. So let's look at another one. Look at the Matthew 28. That's the very last verse of Matthew. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Turn to Matthew 28. Great commission. Last page of Matthew. Last verse of Matthew. 28, 20. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then the verse... The chapter 28. Beginning verse 20. And I'll, I'll start in 19 because it starts the sentence. If that's okay. 28, 20. Matthew 28, 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the King James says, end of the world. All right? I am with you. And that A word is always. You, you heard that, right? Always. That God is with us always. And so much, so much so, you know, as we get older and older, what ends up happening to us friendship-wise? As we get older and older and into our 80s and 90s, what ends up happening in our lives? All your friends are friends. Longer you live, the less people you got around you. I hate to say that because your friends pass away, average age, 73 or something like that for men and women. Uh, I think women are supposed to last a little longer than men, uh, like 75, something like that. But the idea is, is that we can, just by necessity, become very alone. You know what I'm saying? Here on, this, here on earth, you, you guys know plenty of people who we would consider to be shut in. They're at their house. They're, 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 they might even be in an assisted living or a nursing home at this point, but they feel very alone, like they have nobody. And you guys do an excellent job of going to visit those people, call those people, take gifts to those people. But are they truly alone if they're Christians? Well, we just read two that are right there, right? So let's look at another one. John 14. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 14. I'm making this point so that you'll see that it's not just one scripture in one book, but that it's over and over throughout scripture. John 14, 23. John 14, chapter 14, verse 23. John 14, 23. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to, him, to them and make our home with them. Come to them and make my home with them. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you is that for 90% for of us, when I say the word home, like real home, like where you grew up, home, most people get a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling inside, right? Go home. You know, and they always say you can't go home. Well, Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit come and make their home with us. I want you to hear that because it's we are not alone. That's three of them. And then um, one last one here. Let's look at 2 Corinthians and let's look at uh, 122. 2 Corinthians. Somebody yell out that page number for folks. If you, what was it? 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 122. 1500. 
feel like I'm at an auction. I won. Second Corinthians chapter one is where we're going. Second Corinthians one. I'm on a different Bible, so I, that page number doesn't help me. So Second Corinthians one, and then let's look at verse twenty-two. So Second Corinthians, second letter to the church in Corinth by Paul, chapter one, verse twenty-two. And uh, I'm going to start in 21 because that starts the sentence. So, chapter 1, verse 21. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. That's four verses I just gave you, and I can give you that one again in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 5. You know, I'm turning there, but it's the exact same thing. Where it says, I give you the Holy Spirit as a deposit and guarantee of what is to come. So that means He's living in us. God is making His home in us. Lo, I am with you always, right? I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Please, if you're going to get tattoos, get those. Those are great ones in terms of, you know, you know what I'm saying? Dixie's looking at me like, I'm not getting a tattoo. What are you talking about? You know? Um, the, uh, but the idea being, Man, when you wake up in the morning, you ought to have that written on the mirror that you're looking in when you go. Man, gained some weight, lost some hair, my vision's going, whatever it might be that, that's going to discourage you. That should encourage you, right? That should encourage you. Um, when you get in your car, I have a friend that does little little uh, index cards in his car that every day he'll switch it over to a different one. And he just has them right there on his little sunglass holder thing. And there are different scriptures that are encouraging to him. Um but just a reminder that we are not alone. All right? So here's the that's the first one. The second one in terms of us being able to stand up and to understand, you know, to be on that island and be willing to speak up is that um, it is, is the importance of church. Now, the reason that I say that is let's look at Matthew 18, 18. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Matthew 18, 18. This is the reason that, that we do prayer breakfast. This is the reason that we get together for prayer meetings. This is the reason that during our service we stop to pray for people. Is this verse right here? 1818 says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. <coughs> Did you hear all of that in terms of, and this is the importance of the church. Now, we're not alone. We have the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have, we have God with us, right? Emmanuel is the word that's used when we, at Christmas time. God with us, right? In Isaiah, we hear that a lot. Um, when we're reading our verses for Advent candles and stuff. So here we are. We're not alone. And then here's the importance of the church. This is why we need to be affiliated with a church, worshiping with a church body, growing with a church body, is because the two of us agreeing, two of us, not 25, not 50, not 100, 500, two of us agreeing together, it says, I will do what they ask. I am there with you when the two of you are, are um, are, are praying, right? That, you know, we're two or more gathered. All right, so let's look at a couple of other verses. So uh, you guys turn to James chapter 5, verse 13. So right past Hebrews, where you were a minute ago, James chapter 5. Somebody yell out that page number for folks if you get there. James 5, and it's uh, 13, 513. 1605 is the page number for some of you. James 5, 13. Oh, it's 1606. Oh, they're yelling out wrong numbers then. 1606. <laughs> 1074 in the Pink Bible. Magna Carta. 1074, Magna Carta. 1492. All right, so here we go. Now, you guys are turning to this particular passage, but listen to me for a second. So in Acts chapter 12... You don't turn there. I mean, I'm, I'm fine. You can read that. That'd be a great devotional for this week for you to study Acts 12. But the reason and the importance of the church is 
In Acts 12, Peter's in jail. King Herod has thrown him in jail. He's in the innermost cell. He's chained to guards on each side. He's inside many locked doors inside the innermost cell. If he's by himself, what is he thinking? I'm done for. Okay, there's like 15 locked doors between me and the front of this prison. I'm chained to Joe here and Bob here, you know. I can't, you know, and they're chained to the stocks that I'm in. They're chained to, my feet are chained, my hands are chained. There's no hope. It is impossible, right? Isn't that what he's saying? And yet in that story, you find the rest of the disciples. And at this point um, in, in Acts 12, it's, it's over 5,000 people, but there are at least probably 50 people praying together. At, and they're there in the upper room. And what are they praying for? Peter's release from jail. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If Sam and Kinsey and I, we get together, with Dean Jill and I, we go over to their house and we're like, yeah, we got this friend that's in jail. We're going to pray that he gets released. We're okay if that's paroled. We're okay if he gets a, a pardon from the warden, right? Aren't we okay with that? That's okay. We're praying for that. These guys aren't just praying for that, right? They're praying, Lord, get him out now. Get him out of jail. Not that James is going to back the truck up and we're going to hook a chain and rip the wall down right? to get him out that way. That's not what we're talking about. We're praying, God, you do it. And the way that God does it, and this is the part that we're, we're going to get to, living by faith, not by sight, is that God just has the chains fall off. He has an angel appear, pokes Peter on the head, wakes him up. Peter, come on, get up. And Peter gets up, no chains on the feet or the hands, not chained to Joe and Bob anymore. The door swings open, they walk out that door, and Peter goes, this is the best dream I've ever had. This is so cool. You know, it seems so real. And the next door swings open. The next door swings open. The next door swings open, and he suddenly he's standing out in front of the prison. He's, he's like in the alley, looking around, going, this is real. I'm, I'm really here. And the angel goes, goodbye, you know, and, and goes. And Peter, I mean, Let's be honest. There's not an angel with a set of keys like, like the janitor or the super in your building, right? Going unlocking doors. The doors are swinging open. It's what the Bible says. And so Peter goes to their house, and that's where they were praying for him, right? They were praying that he would get out. So we need people so that they can be praying for us through whatever is going on. Whatever situations that were going on, that I'm praying for you, you're praying for me. And that power, you know, that prayer is effective. We're going to read that right now. Okay, so turn to 513, James 513. <coughs> Right here, is anyone among you in trouble? Okay, I think we could probably have the people here could put their hand up and say, yep, I'm in trouble. Not with the law, I'm not talking about that, right? But maybe in trouble financially, maybe in trouble with your marriage, maybe in trouble with your health, maybe in trouble with your kids, your, your house may be sinking into the swamp, I don't know. But we, many of us would put our hand up and say, I got some trouble, I got some issues, right? Is any one of you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I'm sharing that with you because that shows us that we need each other. This is something that we desperately need is, is to have brothers and sisters in Christ who are praying with us and elders. We need leaders that are willing to believe that that can be done, right? Um, now, does this mean that we don't need doctors and medicines? That is not what that means. Because I can tell you right now that I'm okay if Mark is sick with some terminal illness and we lay hands on him and pray for him and he goes to his doctor and his doctor goes, there's a new medicine that I'd like to try on you, Mark. You know, let's see if that works. And Mark takes it for a while and Mark is healed. I'm giving God all the credit for that. Mm -hmm. We prayed for it. There's new medicine. There it is, right? You, you got healed from that. Thank you, people. Glad I'm part of this church, right? Yeah. And that's not what that's saying. But I do want us to see that there... I want us to understand the doors swung open when they prayed for Peter to get out of jail. And there's going to be times when sick people that you know we lay hands on and pray for them, and they're going to be healed on the spot. You need to believe that. Because you've heard me say the story about the guy that I went to church with in Knoxville who was on the walker doing the Tim Conway down the 
This is how he came down the aisle every Sunday for church, right? And he came down there and he said, I want the elders to pray for me. And we got down there and he said, stands up. The guy stands up and he goes, I'm going to tell you this. I've read James chapter 5. If any of y'all don't believe in healing, please leave now. Right? I just want people here who believe that. And so everybody who stayed, you know, there weren't anybody that left. And, and we just prayed for him. That's all we did. It says we anointed him with oil. That means we took EVOO, the same one you use when you make spaghetti. It's the exact same oil. It's not some oil that's passed down from Jesus through 2,000 years. It's just oil that we prayed over. And then we put some on his head. We didn't dump the whole bottle over his head. We didn't do any of that, right? There's no, we didn't write some name on his head like Jesus. We didn't do any of that. We just put some oil on his head, and he went like this. He throws the thing to the side, the walker, right? And he goes, I'm going home. And he walked out. Now, I want you to hear that because I stood there and I watched it with my own two eyes, and that's not something made up from some TV show or some televangelist doing something to get you to send an extra check. That's actually believing what it says in James chapter 5. And that's where we have to get to in our walk is to believe, as George Mueller did, that when we pray, Lord, I need um, $150 to feed these kids, that $150 is going to come in some way. Doesn't mean that it's going to go like a bag of money is going to hear it hit the roof. Right? It's not necessarily that. Twenty-five, thirty-seven $37.23, $57, $18.12, whatever it might be, it comes in and suddenly I have $150 that I needed to feed the kids that God provides. Sometimes it is bank error in your favor, $150. God takes care of it in a bunch of different ways, but we have to believe and know that's true. So the question becomes, do you believe in the impossible? You do. You do believe in the impossible. Not necessarily that God's going to do it, but you believe because you watched, you know, the Miami Marlins when they were in last place in June of a year, when, and, and they went and they hired Jack McKeon, an old guy, to just ride out the rest of the year. They were in dead last place. He comes in, he goes, you guys really just want to come in last place, or would you like to try to win? Because I can show you some things to win. And they listened to him, and they won the World Series that year. That's impossible. That, that, I, I played baseball. When you're dead last in June, I mean, you've been playing for about three months, right, at this point, and you stink. And then they went and won the World Series that same year. Not, not the next year after they drafted new people or got new players in. You can leave it impossible. Um, I actually have probably been to maybe 20 UT football games. My cousins who lived in Chicago decided UT was playing Notre Dame and they'd never been to a game. They'd always heard me talk about it. They decided they'd go buy some tickets, scalp some tickets, and go to the game. This is years ago, 1991. And they called me and they said, we're going over to watch Tennessee play Notre Dame. It's going to be so much fun. And I go, oh, no, we're going to get beat like a drone, you know, whatever. At halftime, we're behind 31 to 7. 31 to 7. And they go, you want to go home? And then my cousin looked, we paid $70 for these tickets. I'm not going home. Let's watch the rest of the game. See what? It's fun. We're sitting out here. It's nice. Or whatever. It's not. Nice. You know, whatever. Tennessee won the game. Notre Dame. That's impossible. It's Notre Dame. Notre Dame was ranked number five. Well, how, we were behind by 31 to 7. That's impossible, right? All the things that I wrote down here, the 1980 U.S. hockey team, that was impossible. That's not even, that wasn't even fathomable, right? Um, uh, you, you heard me say Brother Andrew would go across borders where they had trained guards <coughs> with guns standing there going, anybody comes across with any kind of religious material, arrest them or shoot them on the spot. We're okay with either one. And he would go, dear Lord, make seeing eyes blind so they can't see these Bibles, right? And you remember the first times that he would go across, he said he had them hidden in the, the wheel wells and he had like pieces welded to the car where he could hide them underneath there and stuff like that. And he said after about a year of doing it, he goes, that's an awful lot of trouble. And then he just left boxes. He just, big boxes full of Bibles. All, he had a little Volkswagen bug and it was just completely stuffed. You'd open that front trunk on it, it was nothing but Bibles. That was all it was. Holy Bible. In Russian or whatever or in Czechoslovakian or whatever. And he would pull up and he'd go, Lord, these are your Bibles. I'm trying to get them to your church. Make these guys not see these. They're not giving me a hard time about it. They'd go over. The guards would walk around. They'd have their you know, mirrors looking underneath the car. Raise open the hood. Nothing but Bibles. That's all I'll say. Close the hood. Go on. Right? That's the impossible that I'm talking about. That's, that doesn't make any sense. You have nothing but Bibles. We should take you to jail. We should shoot you on the spot. We have the right and the ability to do that. Didn't happen. Um, Adoniram Judson translated the Bible while he was in prison. You've heard me tell this story 
He, every day while he was in jail, he would translate a little bit of the Bible into the Burmese language. He would stuff the pages into his pillow, and the pillow was in a blue pillowcase that his wife had knitted that had his initials kind of on the end of the pillow, right? A nice little monogram that she had done for him, which I'm sure he got beaten up for in prison, right? Having blue, you know, whatever. But anyway, he was translating the Bible. One day they came in, they did, you know, we're going to check sales, right? Spot check, right? Threw the doors open, went in there, took everything out, looking for, you know, whatever, contraband, whatever, and they threw his pillow in the trash. Threw everything in the, in the trash. All he's left with is the bed. They did it in every cell. Went down through there. Did it all. Days passed. Days passed. And one of his friends is on the other side of town. And he's walking. And he said, I should go by and see Brother Andrew. It's visiting hours. I'm going to go by and see him. As he's walking, trash truck comes by. Right? It's a cart. It's a cart that's being pulled by bulls going down the street. Full of garbage. Like rotten banana peels and just trash. I mean, full of trash. And as it's going by, he looks and he goes, that, that blue pillowcase of his it's got his initials on it, whatever. You know, brother, I mean, you know, Donner was sitting in his cell going, I lost everything. I've been translating for years in here, and then I've lost it all. And that guy goes, hey, hey. Guy stops the thing. He goes, can I have this pillow? Pulls it out through the bars, and it's his pillow, still full of all the pages where he's translated. And it's nasty and disgusting. Yes, it is. And he puts it under his arm, takes it to the prison. He goes, is it your pillow? He goes, where did you get that? It's been two, you know, three days I've been there without my pillow, and it's full of all that stuff. And, and they're just praising God. Because it went in the trash. It's been gone for days. It should be in the dump. And the one guy in this huge city sees it in a cart going by and goes, hey, that's a little monogram on it. Let me pull that out. We have to get to the place to where we believe in the impossible because God can do anything. And what he can do in our lives is based upon how much we believe he can do it. I want you to know that. I want you to know that the level of trust that we have in him. So um, that makes us get to the point to where, um, so what is it that, uh, if I'm sitting here, you know, we tend to go, I live by sight, not by faith. Lots of us. I live I'm only by what I can see. In Balaam's, in the story of Balaam's donkey, in uh, the book of Numbers, the foreign king hires Balaam to come and to put a curse on the Israelites. And he's, Balaam is riding his donkey to go and to listen to this king about putting a curse on the Israelites. This is a true story. It's in the book of Numbers. Numbers 22. Balaam's riding the donkey. The donkey starts kind of going off the road this way. He's yanking him back this way. He starts going off the road this way. He's yanking him back. It's not a mule, it's a donkey. He's sitting there and he's yanking him back, yanking him back, yanking him back. And finally, they go into a little narrow place, and the donkey is smashing his foot into the wall of dirt right there on this side. And he is smacking that donkey at this point. I mean, smacking. And he goes on this side and smashing this foot. He is whipping that donkey. And finally, the donkey just lays down. And he goes, he gets off the donkey, and he is just beating that donkey. And it says, God gives the donkey the ability to speak. I'm being honest. That's what it says. And the donkey says, why are you hitting me? I stopped because there's an angel in front of me right here. I'm summarizing at this point, but that's what he tells him. And then it says, God gave Balaam the ability to see the angel that was standing in the way. And the angel goes, if the donkey hadn't stopped, I was going to kill you. <laughs> that's what I was going to do to put an end to this, right? It, it, but I want you to hear the part where it said God gave him the ability to be able to see. Because for us, we okay, if we go back 500 years and we said, what's a germ? People would go, a germ? What's a germ? Microscop what's microscopic? Ger germs or what? Yeah, if I cough on Bob, Bob will get sick because these in, in, invisible things get on Bob and they attack him and give it to him. And people would look at you and go, you're a moron, Chris. I don't know what these germs are talking about, invisible little whatever they are, but those don't exist until somebody admitted what? A microscope, and then what? suddenly what did we do? Can you imagine the first time somebody looked at a microscope? Oh, my goodness, and they looked down and they went, I should wash my hands more often, right? I mean, it was that kind of thing. They saw all kinds of gunk, and they're like, oh, my goodness, there's these things that are out there. There's viruses, and right? There's all this stuff, but we can't see them unless what? We, somebody gives us the ability to be able to see them, right, with a microscope. So we look at this, 
And so many people would go, there's nothing out in space. What are you talking about? It's not that grand. It's not that beautiful. It's not, right? It's not some fabulous creation. It's not some giant complex, right? Because Amber and I have talked after Sunday school one day, and we both talked about the universe, and we go, you know, it sounds so simple, and yet it is as complex as you want to make it. Oh, my goodness. Our little solar system in the midst of everything is so minute and small and it's the only place that life exists that we are able to find because God created it that way. And it's not just, okay, I put it all in this box and I shook it up real good and it just came out complex. God made it complex. And so for us, we have to start believing, we have to start understanding, okay, and, you know, that God opens our eyes to be able to see things just like in 2 Kings 6, you have the story of Elisha and his servant, and Elisha's laying in the bed, and the servant goes out to get the newspaper. Not true, it wasn't a newspaper there, but he went outside in the morning, and he's surrounded by this army. The, the enemy army is surrounding them. And the servant comes back in and he goes, Elisha, Elisha, there's, there, there's this army out there it's surrounding us, right? It's, it's all this stuff, all this stuff. Right? And Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see. And it says, God opens his eyes. The servant goes back out, opens the front door. And it says, the Lord's army is all along the mountains. And it's ten times what is the army that's surrounding them. And the servant says, God, thank you, Lord, for letting me see. We just did Advent. We just did Christmas. And what's the story of the shepherds? Right? Night time, we're all out here looking at ah, 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 sheep everywhere. And what does it say happen? We're talking about shepherds. This is the lowest class people on the planet at that time. This is the people, you sent them out there if they had no other skills. Right? That's what you're going to do. You're going to go watch the sheep. Ah, 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 ah. And then it says, suddenly, an angel appeared. They were able to see an angel. The angel speaks. I bring you good tidings of great joy, right? We, we read that story. That's part of our advent in terms of lighting candles. True story. And then it says, the heavenly host appears, right? You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, I'm telling you a story that you know. It, and, it, and it's this, hallelujah, right? I mean, it's, that's what you're imagining that they're talking about. This baby's going to be born in Bethlehem. And it says, it was so impressive that they picked up and they left from there. And they went to go to Bethlehem to find the baby that was going to be born. Those are all instances where God allowed us to see. And in our lives, it's so much that way because you guys know this. You sat in a class where you go, I hate math. I hate math. Math is worse. I don't know why. I'll never use math. Math is so dumb. I hate math. What is and you had a teacher that explained it, and you went, I get it. That makes sense to me. I get that. And suddenly the world goes, boom, and it just went like that, right? A science teacher that's explaining stuff to you, and you go, hate science, science is stupid, I don't ever use it, I don't know why. But, you know. And then a science teacher explains to you, and you go, oh my goodness. Or, right? And it's, it's all of these things that, you know, in our minds, for whatever reason, somebody goes, you know, this life's terrible, this world is terrible, uh, and there's nothing good here, it's all just blah, blah, blah. And then somebody goes, let me point this out to you, look over here. And they go, isn't that beautiful? It ain't gonna matter what it is. And we go, you know, that is beautiful. Whether it's a sunset or a sunrise, whether it's the ocean or the mountains, whatever it might be, God points it out, right? It may have been your best friend in school going, look over there at that girl. And you go, she is, that is beautiful. She is beautiful. But it took somebody pointing it out to us and showing it to us. If you ever go to an art museum, a real one like the Louvre in Paris, and you go over now, I'm not talking about where we sell paintings for $30 million that the top half's yellow and the bottom half's blue. That ain't art. Um, I'm talking about where if you go to the Louvre and you go in and you walk in and you see some of those paintings that were done by the masters, like Da Vinci, right? I mean, we're talking about Michelangelo. We're talking about, right? And we look at those paintings and we go, how did somebody do that? Look at that. That is unbelievably amazing. And it opens us up to changes our world. It changes our world. When Sam is teaching my daughter how to play certain notes on a guitar and suddenly she can put four or five or eight notes together and it sounds like a song, it changes everything, doesn't it? it? changes everything. All right, we'll stop there tonight. We'll pick up next week. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we are talking about uh, being able to stand on our own, not 
that we're alone because God is with us, knowing that we have the church as our back, knowing that the applause that we're getting, it may not be any here on earth, but the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Thank you all so much for being here tonight.